Good. Okay, average, above average, just the same. You know, as I said, we've been looking at the doctrines of the church, one of which, of course, being the doctrine of man. Now, as I've said over and over again, perhaps to the point of being uh, repetitious and annoying, understanding the doctrines as we've received them, and particularly understanding the doctrines as they were worked out during the Reformation period, you cannot escape the influence of philosophy. Philosophy is just simply man saying, hey, this is the way I think things are. And consequently, that influence is oftentimes going to be contrary to our Christian doctrinal understanding of the subject at hand. Today, of course, continuing, as I said, with looking at the doctrine of man. You know, but one of the things that I think we all kind of intuitively recognize, as I said a few moments ago, is that we are quite simply messed up. No amen? You know, just because you say amen does not mean that you celebrate some particular point. It means that you simply acknowledge the truth of something. So let's try this again. We as human beings are messed up. Amen. Thank you. That wasn't so hard. It's never hard to admit the truth. But you see, the reason we have this situation is because, well, something that we still struggle with today. That the gospel as it is laid out, and the gospel is more than just the four gospels, the gospel is God's redemptive effort in behalf of mankind. So today I want to just take a little journey as we look at how we are and how God would have us to be, particularly in light of some of the, some of the idiosyncrasies, some of the challenges, some of the struggles that we have. Beginning in Genesis chapter 3, verse 1, we read that now the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, has God indeed said, you shall not eat of every tree of the garden? Now, you guys remember a couple weeks ago, I was talking about being naked, right? Right? You remember that? Was, what, what, are you embarrassed now all of a sudden? No, we were talking about naked. We are talking about the Hebrew word for naked. It was the word arum, not to be confused with the word erum. Remember, arum, ah, erum, eh. Arum, ah, was the ending of verse 25 of the preceding chapter. They were both naked. They were both arum, and they felt no shame, no boche. And as a springboard, we use that to kind of go and to look at some of the ways that we as human beings have strayed from and fallen away from what God would have us to experience as expressed and discussed in the various isms. The isms that are so much part of our public discourse, of we're trying to come to terms with these things, with these realities of life as we understand it. Well, the thing is, is that arum, where it says that they were both naked, the really cool thing about the morphology, meaning the way that the Hebrew language changes and some of its nuances, it's in that very verse I just read you a moment ago. Let me read it to you again. Now, the serpent was more arum, than any beast of the field. So you see, we see a transition here, however subtle it may be, that the author of Genesis is trying to convey to us that something bad is about to come about. We go from the innocent state of nakedness, of the creation state in which God created us and left us there in the garden. But now the serpent introduces himself, and we find that he raises a question. Has God indeed said, you shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, we may eat the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree, which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, you shall not eat it, nor shall you touch it, lest you die. For those of you paying attention to reading your scriptures, you will immediately note that although there's no reason to disbelieve this is the case, the reality is, is that when God prohibits man mankind from eating the fruit, there's no mention of God saying, don't touch it. Okay? That's just a little footnote that you should be aware of. Now, one of the things, one of the mistakes that we make is we think that it's about the fruit. Okay? That is a tragic, epic mistake to think that it's about the fruit. You see, the fruit was not really the important thing with God here. The only thing that was important to God was that his creation trust him. That's it. You want to talk about an easy exam that God was extending to humanity. You want to talk about a softball. The softball of showing whether you believe me, whether you trust me or not, is I ask you to not 
eat this fruit. That's it. That's all there is to it. I mean, can you think of an easier test? An easier test is just simply to affirm that you trust God. That's all God was asking of Adam and Eve at this point. But Eve, of course, entered into this dialogue with a snake. You know, you kind of think about that. I know if I'd been there, my disposition towards snakes, I'm not carrying on a conversation with a talking snake. I'm looking for like a machete or something else at that point, but that's just me. Sin had not entered the world at this point. Then the serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die. For God knows that in the day that you eat of it, your eyes will be open and you will be like God knowing good and evil. So now we have the first lie that's extended to humanity is a one that you're not gonna die. Trust me, people, barring the return of Christ, you're going to die because the scriptures tell us this is the human lot. This is the human predicament. Of course, as I said a few moments ago, philosophy, particularly as it was handed down through the Greeks from Plato and others, had this notion that we were just simply going to be on an endless cycle of reincarnation. And this, of course, has infiltrated itself into the Christian understanding of death. But the reality is, as the scriptures make it very plain, that if you sin, you shall die. But furthermore, Satan extends this promise an empty promise such as it is, that if she were to eat the fruit, that all of a sudden her eyes would be open and she would be like God. Now, if you go back just a couple of few verses here, the interesting thing is the scriptures say that we were created in the image of God. This is one of the things that I looked at earlier in this series. We are all image bearers. So if you stop and think about it, what is this serpent offering her that she doesn't really already have? We are created in the image of God. There's nothing for us to be ashamed of in this regard. There's no reason for us to reach and desire for something more than what God has already endowed us with. But because we're never seeming to be satisfied with what we have, it says, so when the women saw that the tree was good for food, that it was pleasing to the eyes and a tree desirable to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. She also gave to her husband with her and he ate now, just one moment here, if we stop and think about this, she sees it, she starts to desire it, she starts to want it, and so she satisfies that desire. And I would ask you, how many of you experience the same thing in your life? You know something that's really bad for you, you know something you shouldn't want, something you shouldn't touch, but yet you find yourself kind of drawn to it. It's the human predicament. It's the nature of sin, and what is sin? Sin, of course, is lawlessness, but what is lawlessness? In essence, it is broken relationships. So when she took the fruit, Eve, in essence, was just saying to God, I don't trust you. I don't trust you. I don't trust you. I don't trust you. I want nothing to do with you. That's, in essence, what she was saying. And something else that we see here that is equally tragic, although Eve, of course, according to the scriptures, was deceived, Adam apparently knew exactly what he was getting into, which leads us to another problem that we deal with today, and that is indifference. We stand around and we watch, we observe, and we just put our hands up in the air and say, not my problem, or nothing I can do about it. And so tragically, it says in verse 7, then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they knew that they were erum, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves coverings. And you think about this here, how ridiculous this must have been to an observer. You've got these two presumably magnificent, perfectly created beings, all natural. And now because of the entry of sin, they're broken with themselves. Now Arum, Arum has given way to Bosch. Now they deal with shame. And I ask you, how much shame do you have in your life? How much guilt do you carry around with you? Now let me ask you another question related to that. How many of you are covering it up? How many of you are liars? Let me have a hand. Let me show a show of hand of all the liars here. See, the beautiful part about that question is I get the liars raising their hand in affirmation, and I get the other liars keeping their hands down. <laughs> it's a no win question. Because you see, we, just like Adam and Eve, are doing the exact same thing. Now, we do a much more sophisticated job of it, mind you. We try to cover things up so that we don't want people to know what the person is that we really are interacting with. We don't want them to know the truth about us, but we are consistent in our faithfulness to lying and being deceiving with one another. So if we look back at Adam and Eve, let us not look with any bit of judgment upon them as though oh, we would never sink to something so low because ladies and gentlemen, we do it all the time. 
We interact with liars constantly, people who are covering things up and we don't even realize it because we're so busy covering up our own stuff. Now, I might ask you, how do you like this outfit? Do you like the blue? Does it complement my brown eyes nicely and everything? You like the tie, nice little gray and blue and red and everything like that? I look presentable, I look kind, I look nice. I look uh, somebody who's led you to go to a job interview, perhaps. But the truth is, is all you have to do is just go just even the slightest level below and the truth is oftentimes revealed. You see, we, like Adam and Eve, are running around with fig leaves on. We have this shredded identity that we try to present to others in order to make ourselves more acceptable to them, to make ourselves seem more righteous to them. We are a community of liars. This has been humanity's experience since the very beginning, since the fall, since we took of that fruit and said to God, we don't trust you. We broke relationship not only with God, but we broke relationship with ourselves. And we continue to deal with the consequences thereof. We did it because our eyes overcame us and we became absorbed and we became obsessed with having something that was not part of God's plan for us. And then it says here in verse 8, And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. Everybody's hiding from God. Everybody is hiding from God. You know, a couple of weeks ago, I looked at those subjects that are so sensitive and are, are, are quite uncomfortable for t- people to talk about. Issues of the isms, as I titled them, transgenderism, homosexualism, humanism, and whatnot. I had people come up to me and say, that was really brave of you to talk about that. And I think about brave, really? Why is that brave? Why is that brave to acknowledge that amongst us there are people who have particular sins that may not be the norm for us, but yet nonetheless are in sin just as we are in sin? We're all running from God. Scriptures make this abundantly clear. It says, no one seeks God. No, not one, which means that you are not seeking God. No matter how nicely dressed up you may have made your sin, no matter how many times you have said such and such, You have not sought God. God has sought you. God is the seeker of lost souls. That means he's hunting after all of us. He's chasing after all of us, regardless of what sin it is that divides us against him. And so the scriptures tell us that they hid from him. And then the Lord God called to Adam and he said to him, where are you? So he said, I heard your voice in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, and I hid myself. And he said, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree of which I commanded you that you should not eat? And I ask you right now, are you hiding from God? Are you hiding from God right now? Are you sitting here covered in your fig leaves because there's parts of your life that you're ashamed of? Because there's things that are within you that you find so repulsive, you think that the church would find so disgusting, that you think that you yourself have to cover your evilness? Is that how you're sitting here now? Where are you? God asked that question of our greatest grandfather, where are you? And he says to you sitting here right now at 4409 Pleasant View, where are you? Why are you hiding from me? Why are you running? Who told you that you were naked? Who told you that you were beyond my grace? You see, we know who told us that we were beyond his grace. We know exactly who told us this, for we read in the first epistle of John, in chapter 2, we know this. It says to us here, but you have an anointing. You have an anointing. But that anointing comes after verse 15. Do not love the world or the things of the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world is passing away, and the lust of it. But he who does the will of God abides forever. 
You see, this world is burning up. It's burning out. It's given all its answers, and they've been found to be wanting. Now, I know when we talk about lust and we talk about the world, that's all kind of churchy-sounding language, meaningless for the most part to people, unless you realize and recognize that we're all seeking to find our way. God presents a way, and everything opposed to God presents a way. Now, the, granted, the things that the world presents to us are fairly attractive. They appeal to us. Physically, they appeal to us. You know, one of the tragedies of, of the church is in a lot of ways we reflect the world in our personal conduct. Now, I say it's a tragedy in that that exacts an enormous price on people. You know something? One of the isms that I didn't discuss that, you know, is more of a normal type of ism? Well, it's pornography. Remember, I mentioned that word in reading the context of a passage where some Pharisees had come to Jesus and talked about divorce. And he said to them, unless it is for porneia, you're not to be divorced. Porneia, of course, is the root word from which we get pornography. And if the stats hold true, depending on which authority you cite, which authoritative figure, it tells me something about this congregation. It tells me that at least 50% of you men, perhaps as many as 70%, are addicted to pornography. Think about that. A gathering of 10 men, 10 men, 10 men, anywhere from five to seven of them are struggling with this. The numbers for ladies are in some ways quite astounding as well. Anywhere from 38 to 50 percent. So it tells me I'm talking to a whole lot of people right now that are sitting here just like this. You're all ripped up. You're all torn up. You're in a desperate place. And you're trying to cover yourself trying to make yourself look respectable. And have you ever found yourself struggling and you just can't seem to get past something? You ever wonder about this? I mean, have you ever... Now, like, here, there's a passage in Proverbs. It's one of my favorite verses. One of my favorite verses in the Scripture because it is so crystal clear and it has so defined the human experience not only as it relates to pornography, but as it relates to a whole host of other things that we struggle with. It's a, beautiful, it's a beautiful assessment of the human predicament. It reads as follows. As a dog returns to his own vomit, so a fool repeats his folly. Amen? Amen. As a dog returns to his vomit, so a fool repeats his folly. And we think about our lives and we think about how often we have returned like a dog to its vomit, to those things that are vile and disgusting and those things that we want to turn our backs against, those things that we don't want to have any more control over us, those things that we don't want to have any more power over us. And we sit there and we think to ourselves, is there perhaps no God or is it possible that God doesn't care about me? Because I keep struggling here, I keep fighting here, I keep working here. Let me tell you what part of your problem is. Behold, part of your problem. It's an illustration, okay. So. It's pinkish, it's grayish. It's pinkish, it's grayish. You know, we have this amazing thing. It weighs a few pounds, and it sits right here. Underneath, maybe a quarter inch or so of bone. It's called a brain. Now, you know the amazing thing about the brain is that God designed it so that it's extraordinarily efficient. Now, what is the measure of efficiency? What do we mean when we say efficiency? It's pretty simple. Lazy. Okay, now here's the amazing thing. 
Amazing thing about the way your brain does things. Everything your brain does, it wants to maximize and do efficiently. And how do you know when you've achieved efficiency? How do you know when you've become optimally efficient at any task? Here's how you know. You don't think about it. When you get to the point when you're doing something and you don't have to think about it, you have arrived. Isn't that great? I mean, you think about it. how many of you got up this morning, you, you, you got up, you brushed your teeth, you had breakfast, you brushed your teeth again, however you do your little ritual in the morning. You got yourself dressed, you got in the car, and before you knew it, some guy was standing in front of you holding a grayish pink piece of PVC pipe. And you have no idea how you got here. Well, congratulations, ladies and gentlemen. You have arrived at optimal efficiency for being able to drive a car and to navigate. And how did this happen? Well, it didn't happen overnight. See, it took time. You got out there, you had your parents in the car, you terrified your parents in the car, and eventually you became a little bit better to the point that they trusted you to get out of sight, and you started driving, doing your own thing. Meanwhile, with inside of this brain that you have here, there were neuro passageways that were being laid down. And they were boop, boop, boop. neurons communicating. Boop, boop, boop. It doesn't actually make that sound, except in my head sometimes late at night. And it was just going like that. They were just connecting. And after a while, before you knew it, you have this super passage that is formed in your brain. We typically refer to it as a habit. Now, as I said, whatever we do, our brain seeks to maximize it. Whatever we do, our brain seeks to find the easy way. This includes good stuff, and it includes bad stuff as well. This is why Paul speaks in Romans, that which I want to do, I don't do. And that which I do want, don't want, you know the passage, right? That which I don't want to do, I do. That which I do want to do, I do not. He finds himself in a place that many of us are sitting here struggling with, that there are things that we want to let go in our life. There's things that we want to overcome. But yet, strangely enough, we feel like we're that dog that keeps going back to its vomit and keeps chewing it up and coming back again. But the reality is it doesn't have to be that way, people, because the reality is the way God made us is, is that Satan manipulates us and he takes advantage of us. He knows how we work. He recognizes the struggles that we have. But, you know, sometimes we're complicit in this even beyond the act itself. So it goes on to say here in verse number 12, do you see a man wise in his own eyes? There's more hope for a fool than for him. If you want to live your life thinking that you can do it totally contrary to what the scriptures teach about the basic reality of the human predicament, you have established yourself as a wise man or a wise woman in your own sight. And consequently, you put yourself beyond the counsel of Scripture. But the Scriptures say there is more hope for a fool than for him. And the Scriptures go on to say the lazy man says there is a lion in the road, a fierce lion in the streets. As a door turns on its hinges, so the lazy man on his bed. In other words, people recognize there's a danger. They recognize there's a threat. And all they simply do is say, hey, there's a lion coming at me. Hey, I got a problem. But, like a man on a hinge, there's a problem. Should do something. There's a problem. I should do something. There's a problem. I should do something. There's a problem. I should do something. And nothing ever changes. Why? Because we're lazy, people. Admit it. You're lazy. I'm lazy. We're all lazy. Oh, somebody, oh no, I got a solid work ethic. Yeah, yeah, you're, yeah, whatever. You're still lazy. <laughs> How can I prove this? How many of you like to do things the hard way? Nobody likes to do things the hard way. We want the easy way. And even if we're doing something hard, we're doing it with the hope that eventually it'll become easy. Isn't that the case? So there, you're lazy. Admit it. I admit it. You admit it. We're all good to go now. But the scriptures tell us that even when it comes to these struggles, that there's a different way. Verse 15, the lazy man buries his hand in the bowl. It wearies him to bring it back to his mouth. 
The lazy man is wiser in his own eyes than seven men who can answer sensibly. You think about it, and sometimes you just want to give up, don't you? Any things you're struggling with, the addictions, whatever it may be, isn't the case that sometimes you just want to say, I'm tired. It is too hard. This is painful. This is destroying me, but it's just not worth it anymore. That's how it is. That's the human predicament. But back in the letter that John wrote, a little further, a little deeper into chapter 2, I already read you one verse of it, we find the solution. But you have an anointing from the Holy One. And you know all things. I have not written to you because you do not know the truth, but because you know it and that no lie is of the truth. You know, here is something that is tangentially related to this here. I found that as a pastor, I really don't spend a lot of time telling people what they're doing wrong. Okay? In fact, if, if I've actually told you what you're doing is wrong and it was a revelation to you, then that means something's out of skew. Here's what I mean by that. The work of the Holy Spirit is to convict us of sin, righteousness, and judgment. The work of the Holy Spirit. Now, granted, I should be, all of us should be instruments of the Holy Spirit, but it's been my observation that people pretty much come to you they usually have a pretty good inclination of where their life is askew. They really do. Most of the people that you're worried about, that you know are sinning, they pretty much know it. Now, they may not have been able to fully articulate it. They may not have been able to fully form it in their head, but they know in their guts when things just aren't right. It manifests itself and a whole host of difficult, painful, dysfunctional behavior. It always comes out. So the scriptures go on to say here, who is a liar? But he who denies that Jesus is the Christ. He is antichrist who denies the Father and the Son. Whoever denies the Son does not have the Father either. He who acknowledges the Son has the Father also. Now, a lot of times this passage here is used in an apologetic fashion. What I mean by apologetic? Apologetics is this whole discipline within the Christian tradition of being able to give an answer for the faith. This passage here is frequently applied to other religions, those religions that do not acknowledge Jesus as the Christ. They say, there, there is the spirit of Antichrist. But you know, in a much more practical, much more immediate way that we all have oftentimes embraced the spirit of the Antichrist is when we say, God, my life is such a mess. I am such a sinner. I am so faulty. I am so broken. I am so beyond your redemption. Is that not the spirit of Antichrist? Is it not the spirit of Antichrist that says to us when we look in the mirror, you are a filthy loser. I know what you did last night because you did it like you did the night before, like you did it the day before, like you did it last week, like you've done it over and over again. You must just give up. That is the spirit of Antichrist. Because the scriptures tell us that if we have seen Jesus, we have seen the Father. And if we've seen the Father, we have seen that the Father so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. And that he'd sent his son not to condemn the world, but that through the world he might redeem it. So anything that denies that God has the power to transform you, anything that says that you must wallow and you must stay, is the Antichrist. You've heard his voice. Sometimes I'll bet his voice sounds just like your own. What would even be a compounded tragedy is if the church ever said to you something like that. If the church ever observed you in your sin and turned its eyes away, turned its nose up as though you somehow wallow in a pit of filth. That's the spirit of Antichrist. Rejecting 
rejecting others because their sin is not like our own. It's the spirit of Antichrist. Because see, the spirit of Christ can transform anyone. The spirit of Christ can redeem anyone. That's the truth, you see. But we live in a world where God takes his time. Thank God. Thank God. He takes his time with us. Now, it actually makes sense when you think about the human predicament. You go back to this here. You know, even when we sin, whatever it may be, we want to maximize it so we can do it without thinking. Lots of research has shown in the addiction process how even after a while for some people, just the mere image of some things triggers a biochemical response in the brain that starts a person down a path before they even realize it. You know, here's the funny thing is, the other day, just doing a little simple mental experiment with myself, I decided I was gonna do something different. I decided I was gonna simply take a different route to the grocery store. Nothing dramatic, nothing dramatic. I literally said to myself, I want to drive a different way to the grocery store. You know what I did? I got in my car, I sat in my car, I drove out of the driveway and went the same way I always did. <laughs> and I'm like, like a quarter of the way down the street and I'm like, ah! Just doing a simple experiment with myself. Now granted, no harm, no foul. That is something so benign, almost to be ridiculous. So you think when you've got these challenges, you've got these addictions, you've got these struggles that are extraordinarily powerful and then you beat yourself up? You ignore the scriptures that say that therefore, for all those who are in Christ Jesus, there is therefore no condemnation. This is not to say that God doesn't want to transform us because certainly God wants to transform us, but we have to take things into account. If God made you into the man or woman that you will be, that you will be in 10 years, even if he doesn't come, if he turned you into that man or woman overnight, you would go insane because you'd have no reference point by which to understand yourself. You'd have no way by which to navigate yourself in this life, even if it was for the better. So this is part of the reason why God works with us, but this is also why the scriptures acknowledge that it's a struggle, it's difficult to be human, that we are oftentimes like that dog returning to our vomit, but we're also, as the sage in Proverbs says, although a righteous man falls seven times, it's the wicked who remains down. So you get up. You get up and you rebuke, you push back, you reject the spirit of Antichrist that says, I can't be different, I can't be changed because I failed. Well, so what? You think you're surprising God in your failure? You think you're surprising the scriptures? You're thinking there's no allocation for you? Because it goes on to say, therefore, in verse 24, let that abide in you which you heard from the beginning. If what you heard from the beginning abides in you, you also will abide in the Son and in the Father. And this is the promise that he has made us eternal life. These things I have written to you concerning those who try to deceive you, but the anointing which you have received from him abides in you, and you do not need that anyone teach you, but as the same anointing teaches you concerning all things and is true and is not a lie, and just as it has taught you, you will abide in him. The victory of a Christian, the life of a Christian is to get away from the fig leaves, to quit trying to cover ourselves with our own pitiful righteousness and instead to accept the righteousness of Christ and to remain in him and to follow him and now little children abide in him that when he appears we may have confidence and not be ashamed before him at his coming. If you know that he is righteous, you know that everyone who practices righteousness is born of him. Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us that we should be called children of God. Therefore the world does not know us because it did not know him. You ladies and gentlemen are children of God. Do not embrace the spirit of Antichrist. Do not embrace the spirit of Antichrist, which says, you are what you are, there's nothing you can do about that. Whether it's pornography or any number of host of other challenges and sins that we embrace, 
What is sin? Sin is lawlessness. What is lawlessness? It's breaking relationship with God, with ourselves, with everybody around us, and with the creation itself. This is the revelation of Scripture to us. But we have this anointing. We have this anointing that the world doesn't know. Beloved, now we are children of God. And it has not yet been revealed what we shall be, but we know that when he is revealed, we shall be like him. We shall be like him. We know this. And everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself just as he is pure. God would have us to be as we were always intended to be. Back in that garden, we were meant to be a holy creation. We were meant to be a holy people. That's what God is working towards. He recognizes our faults. He recognizes our frailties. He recognizes our shortcomings. And he still says, come anyway. Just come anyway. I don't want you to hide from me. I'm looking for you. I don't want you to embrace the spirit of Antichrist that says that I don't love you because you have sinned, because you've failed. But instead, I want you to experience the anointing. I want you to experience the righteousness that I've always had in store for you. You know, there's no need to hide. There's no reason to wallow, to be afraid, and to be shameful. You know, we've got some young people that are going to come up on the platform here right now. And they're going to perform beautiful music. I'm going to ask if there's anybody who just feels a need to just, to just stop hiding. I don't need to know what it is. I'm not asking you what it is. But anybody just wants to put something behind and wants to take a step forward, recognizing that, that we, we sometimes we stumble and we fall and we make mistakes and we sin even after we've decided we want it to break, but we recognize that there is hope. I'm going to ask you if you want to just come forward here and we'll have prayer while they're playing for us. It's just, it's just taking that step of saying, I want... I want that something different that God would have for me. I reject the spirit of antichrist in my life that's telling me that I'm beyond redemption. I, I, want you to, I want you to make that decision, whatever it may be that's in your life that you want to just be done with. But more than anything, I want you to be done with this notion. I want you to be done with the notion that God rejects you. I want you to be done with that because that's the spirit of antichrist. I don't care how successful you've been in overcoming whatever it is that you've been struggling with. And frankly, I don't even care how you're going to do later. I care about this moment. For the scriptures tell us, today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts.